In 1846, near a border traced by a river, two neighbors went to war. The fighting between the United States and Mexico began near the Rio Grande, then raged deep into the heart of the Mexican nation. From the shores of the Pacific to the Gulf Coast of Veracruz, to a final assault on the halls of Matazuma, Mexico City itself. In the end, Mexico was stripped of nearly half its territory. California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Land that transformed the United States into a continental power reaching from sea to sea. This is the story of a war that reshaped the continent and forged a new identity for its peoples. A war that caused wounds that have yet to heal. The war between the United States and Mexico. The soldiers came from every region of their country, from Missouri, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Maine, from Chihuahua, Oaxaca, Guanajuato, and Veracruz. They met at Palo Alto, Cerro Gordo, Buena Vista, and on other faraway battlefields, where men with names like Holloway and Smith and Page, Flores, Cano, Rivera, fought each other and died. There were others who were not soldiers, ordinary people called upon to sacrifice everything to war. For Mexican and Indian families in the territory surrendered to the United States, there was a bitter consequence, even to peace. Many would be made to feel like foreigners in their native land. In the late summer of 1848, a group of 15 Mexican writers, intellectuals, soldiers, and politicians gathered near the fallen capital to write an account of the recent conquest of their country. One of the writers was a young journalist named Guillermo Prieto, destined to become one of his nation's most beloved poets. Prieto and the others called their work Apuntes, notes for the history of the war between Mexico and the United States. For the first time, they came to measure their strength and to sustain the rights of their respective nations. These sons of two distinct races now meeting to appear before a supreme being, destroying each other in the new continent as they had in the old. They are a group of Mexicans who recognize that they have not done things well, but that the military defeat was not a moral defeat, that out of that experience would come lessons that would save the country, consolidate the country. In the United States, soldiers, journalists, artists, and historians published their own accounts of the war with Mexico. Some saw the victory as proof that theirs was a model republic favored by God. Yet others wondered if the conquered territory had come at the price of the nation's ideals. Thousands of returning soldiers, men like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Ulysses S. Grant brought back experience that would serve them well against each other in the Civil War to come. But for now, it seemed that the war had forged a national identity, had revealed what one writer called the native germ of the American character. America is the country of the future. It is a country of beginnings, of projects of vast designs and expectations. The bountiful continent is ours, state on state and territory on territory, to the waves of the Pacific Sea. <laughs> 
one thing is plain. Here in America is the home of man. Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was the beginning of a new era. The United States and Mexico would share a new border, would have to learn to live together as neighbors. The U.S.-Mexican War was a clash between neighbors who were strangers, two republics born into separate worlds. One was a brash, rapidly expanding nation of 20 million, driven by democratic principles and transformed by new technologies. The United States was oftentimes referred to as a go-ahead nation, in quotation marks, a go-ahead people. Uh, with the locomotive almost as a symbol. Uh, this is all part of this boundlessness, all part of this idea of no limits uh, on what people can achieve. Meanwhile, Mexico's seven and a half million people were living a very different experience, rooted in Spanish and native traditions handed down for centuries. Mexico City, capital of New Spain for 300 years and of the Aztec Empire before that, had always been the cultural and political heart of the nation. Here, a university, printing houses, hospitals, and theaters had flourished before the pilgrims landed on the shores of Massachusetts Bay. The United States was born modern. They are already under the influence of the Industrial Revolution, of a capitalist system. When Mexico takes shape after the Spanish conquest and the blending with indigenous peoples, it inherits medieval European institutions, or almost medieval, and a deep history of native traditions. For the United States, to be modern is an act of natural evolution. For Mexico, to become modern means tearing down its institutions, destroying its social system, and changing its way of thinking. From 1810 to 1821, Mexico fought a successful but devastating war for independence from Spain. Some hoped to establish a political system inspired by the U.S. model. But the early years of the new republic were chaotic. The government was constantly undermined by generals fighting for power. In the 27 years between the revolution and the end of the war with the United States, Mexico would undergo 22 changes of administration. At its core, the country was experiencing a terrible crisis because it had lost its sense of leadership and political control, and this made Mexico extremely One of Mexico's greatest resources was land, almost one and a half million square miles. But the 10-year struggle for independence had devastated the nation's economy and decimated its population. 
Mexico was left unable to colonize its distant northern provinces, and the borderlands lay directly in the path of a growing United States. The United States had grown by purchasing land from other nations, but when the U.S. tried to buy Mexican territory, Mexico would not sell. For them, it was a matter of national honor, not just pride, to maintain the integrity of all of the territory they had inherited from Spain. Now Mexico worried that what the United States couldn't buy, it would take. The haughtiness of these Republicans does not permit them to look on us as equals, but as inferiors. In my opinion, their conceit extends itself so far as to believe that their capital will be the capital of all the Americas. Jose Manuel Sosaya, first Mexican minister to the United States. Two republics, bound by geography, yet separated by different histories and cultures. Few doubted that a showdown was approaching. In 1836, Mexico suffered a wound that it would blame on the United States. The blow was struck here, in Mexico's northern province of Tejas. In the Texas of 1821, only 2,500 Mexicans lived near a scattering of isolated missions and in a few small settlements. Tejanos lived deep in Indian territory, far from the protection of Mexico City. More colonists were needed. In 1823, the Mexican government made a fateful decision. It opened Texas to foreign settlers. The offer was cheap land and deferred taxes. Immigrants would become Mexican citizens. The plan worked only too well. North Americans flooded across the border bringing with them their own language and culture. When Mexico tried to close the border, the immigrants came anyway, illegally. Mexican residents in Texas soon found themselves outnumbered 10 to 1. Y como no teníamos un and since we did not have an army to guard the border, we know how difficult it is today to protect it, right? Even if you set up roadblocks or whatever, people can get through. Well, in those days, it was very easy. For years, the colonists managed their own affairs. But in 1835, the Mexican Congress abolished most of the state's rights and centralized power in Mexico City. The move triggered a series of revolts in states across the country, Zacatecas, California, Yucatan, and Texas. On December 12, 1835, Sam Houston, commander-in-chief of the rebel Texas Army, issued a proclamation. Citizens of Texas, you have realized the horrors of anarchy and the dictation of military rule. Your rights must be defended. The oppressors must be driven from our soil. The rebellion in Texas infuriated Mexico's president, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. The foreigners who wage war against the Mexican nation have violated all laws and do not deserve any consideration. And for that reason, no quarter will be given them. In their audacity, they have declared a war of extermination against the Mexicans, and we should treat them in the same manner. 41 years old, General Santa Ana was a career military officer who had risen to the presidency through a shrewd combination of ambition, charisma, and guile. The general was fond of the dramatic gesture. He would take care of the rebellion in Texas himself. Viva! Viva Santa Ana! In February of 1836, Viva! Santa Ana and his army arrived in Texas. The first major battle was fought near San Antonio 
at an abandoned mission known as the Alamo. Against the advice of his own officers, Santa Ana ordered his troops to storm the compound. All of the defenders inside were killed. But the Mexicans suffered far too many casualties for a victory Santa Ana later said was but a small affair. Two weeks later at Goliad, Mexican officers acting on Santa Ana's orders executed 340 Texas prisoners. The brutality of the campaign was meant to force the Texans into submission. Instead, Remember the Alamo and Goliad became battle cries of revenge. At San Jacinto, not far from the Texas coast, the afternoon of April 21st was warm and drowsy. Santa Ana was confident of victory. His troops were resting. Suddenly, Sam Houston's Texans charged the Mexican camp. The battle was over in 20 minutes, but the killing continued until the Texans had satisfied their vengeance. More than 600 Mexicans were killed. 700 were taken prisoner. Santa Ana tried to escape, but was captured and brought before Houston. He was dressed in the pants of a private, still wearing his silk shirt. It was a moment those who were there would never forget, the birth of the independent Republic of Texas. In Mexico, the loss unleashed a wave of anger against the United States. We made a present of Texas to the Americans of the North, wrote a general named Jose Maria Tornelli Mendeville. After we took them to our bosom, they destroyed us. The loss of Texas would inevitably result in the loss of New Mexico and the Californias. Little by little, our territory will be absorbed until only an insignificant part is left to us. Our national existence, acquired at the cost of so much blood, would end like those weak meteors which, from time to time, shined fitfully in the firmament and disappear. For Santa Ana, the loss of Texas would forever be a mark of humiliation and defeat. Since I was not a tragic hero in my misfortune, I am branded a traitor. The distance between one and the other is immense. Disgraced, Santa Ana returned to his estate in Mexico. Two years later, he suffered another loss, a battle wound that led to the amputation of his left leg below the knee. The surgeon did a poor job, and Santa Ana would live the rest of his life in pain. But he used the incident to win back the hearts of his country's people. Once again, he became president of Mexico, only to be once again forced from office. As he sailed for exile in Havana that spring of 1845, even Santa Ana could not have predicted that he would return the following year to lead his country against the armed forces of the United States. On a rainy day in March, 1845, United States President James Knox Polk stood on the steps of the Capitol in Washington. There, he delivered an inaugural address intended to be heard not only in his own country, but in the capitals of Mexico and Great Britain. Since the Union was formed, the number of states has increased from 13 to 28. Foreign powers do not seem to appreciate the true character of our government. To enlarge its limits is to extend the dominions of peace over additional territories and increasing millions. James K. Polk had entered the presidency with a solid reputation as a congressman and speaker of the House. His wife Sarah had managed his early political campaigns and was well known in Washington circles for her intelligence and charm. By comparison, 
Polk was considered humorless and rigid, even by those who admired the discipline he brought to his job. He had a very strong sense of duty and professional obligation and a very, very strong work ethic. As he was fond of saying, uh, I am the hardest working man in the United States, and few could really argue with him. Each evening, Polk would meticulously chronicle the day's accomplishments in his diary. Here he complained that his days were filled with office seekers, visiting groups of school children, tourists staring at him as he ate. Only at night could he reflect on what he had come to the White House to achieve. Polk's goals were influenced by his mentor, Andrew Jackson, whose philosophy of westward expansion had inspired a new generation. They believed that the government should open up these regions so that they, so that the resources there can be exploited, and anything that gets in the way of that exploitation should obviously be removed. The expansionist vision would be condensed into one of the most powerful phrases in American history, manifest destiny. It was a conviction that God had intended North America to be under the control of the Americans. It's a kind of early projection of Anglo-Saxon supremacy, and there is a racist element in it, but there is also an idealistic element. To extend the boundaries of the United States was to extend the area of freedom. This was, this was a, common, a common feeling. Uh, the model republic had certain uh, obligations. During his campaign, Polk had called for the annexation of Texas and the occupation of Oregon Territory. But on both issues, he faced the risk of war. Mexico had never recognized the independence of Texas. Great Britain claimed Oregon. But the first diplomatic crisis of the Polk administration would involve Mexico. In February of 1845, the U.S. Congress voted to annex Texas. For years, Mexico had warned the United States that to do so would be the equivalent of war. Mexican Ambassador Juan Almonte wrote to the U.S. Secretary of State calling the annexation of Texas an act of aggression. Nowhere in the annals of modern history can one find a more unjust act to rob a friendly nation like Mexico of so large a portion of her territory. Almonte then demanded his passport, breaking diplomatic relations. The United States and Mexico were now one step closer to war. In July of 1845, President Polk ordered U.S. troops to the Texas coast. Their mission was to defend the border with Mexico. Texas had accepted the United States' offer of annexation, and Mexican troops were on the march north under orders to secure the border with the United States. In Mexico City, powerful voices were calling for war. Even so, the government of President General Jose Joaquin de Herrera hoped for a peaceful solution. Herrera had inherited a country left in shambles by Santa Ana, and the president was convinced that Mexico could not win a war with the United States. But with the nation in the grip of war fever, Herrera knew that his desire for peace could lead to his downfall. A scholar and politician, Jose Fernando Ramirez, saw the dilemma clearly. The struggle will be lost by the first one to speak about peace. And for that reason, no one wants to express the terrible word. Quietly, Herrera looked for a way to preserve national honor without going to war. He let it be known that he would accept an envoy from the United States to discuss the Texas question. Polk responded quickly. His choice for the mission was John Slidell, a congressman from Louisiana who was fluent in Spanish. But now the president's objective extended beyond Texas to the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. There were rumors that Britain also had its eye on California, 
Polk instructed Slidell to try and buy it first. Slidell was told to remind Mexico that it owed the United States more than two million dollars. The claims would be forgiven if Mexico would sell its northern territories to the United States. Mientras el gobierno mexicano piensa que el enviado while the Mexican government thinks the representative, the special North American representative, is coming to renew relations and surely to pay or arrange for indemnification for the loss of Texas, for the North Americans, Texas is already a thing of the past. And the only thing that interests them is to buy territory. The one way to provoke the Mexicans into resistance was the way that Polk had chosen, that is to uh, present a, a strong front and bluff the Mexicans into resisting or into uh, yielding. In other words, negotiating with them at Cannon's point. Polk's instructions were leaked to the press and Slidell arrived in Veracruz amid reports that Herrera was about to sell off the Northern Territories. The Mexican president was caught completely off guard. He tried to put off the meeting with Slidell, but it was too late. He and his cabinet were accused of treason. Desperately, Herrera tried to save his government and convince his country that there was no honor in fighting a war the nation could not sustain. War with the United States over Texas is a bottomless abyss into which the Republic will sink along with all her hopes for the future. By now, few were listening. In San Luis Potosí, north of Mexico City, an ambitious general named Mariano Paredes watched as Herrera's government crumbled. Paredes was under orders to march north to the defense of the Texas border. Instead, he turned his army around, marched on Mexico City, and forced Herrera to resign. As the new president of Mexico, Mariano Paredes promised to lead his country into what he called a necessary and glorious war. Corpus Christi, September 4th, 1845. Dear Sue, this is the dirtiest place I believe I was ever in. It is almost impossible to keep clean. I have got on a dark woolen purple shirt. It may smell a little after the second week, but the strong breeze carries off the odor. I have just been begging Crittenden to wash himself but he appears, like all the rest, to have no regard for the nasal or optical organs of his fellow wallowers. Napoleon Dana. He had been named for his father's heroes, but Lieutenant Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana arrived in Texas determined to find glory on his own. Dana was one of 4,000 U.S. soldiers camped on the beach at Corpus Christi and along the banks of the Nueces River. The small force represented almost half of the entire Army of the United States. The soldiers were poorly paid. Nearly 50% of the enlisted men were recent immigrants. No, no, that army was... Uh was no powerhouse, it was, it, a juggernaut was not the word for that army at that time. But uh, they had good officers, West Point had began to take hold. West Point was founded 43 years earlier, but it was not appreciated, it was always on the verge of being done away with. Our tradition has been always that fear, always that fear of militarism, and therefore uh, taking every measure possible to prevent the military from beginning to feel too important. The troops were commanded by a 61-year-old general from Kentucky 
named Zachary Taylor. Raised on a frontier, Taylor was blunt and plain spoken. The general disdained military pomp and ceremony and disregarded regulations concerning military dress. He favored straw hats, wore ragged pants and dusty coats. One man said he looked more like an old farmer going to market with eggs. But Taylor had earned respect for the fearless way he had fought alongside his men five years earlier during the Seminole Indian War in Florida. To his soldiers, who admired both his courage and his homespun ways, he was known as Old Rough and Ready. Throughout the fall and winter of 1845, Taylor organized his army. There was plenty of time for young officers like Napoleon Dana and 23-year-old Ulysses S. Grant, only two years out of West Point to train with the troops under their command. Now you would think that in a country of whom so many of the citizens were frontiersmen, that you would pull them together with their muskets and you'd have an army. But it so happens that the techniques you use for survival on the frontier include running away when the situation calls for it, uh, it includes uh, independence and self-reliance. Well now, those are all fine virtues, but when you come to an army, you want people who do what you say, and also if you tell them to hold a position at all costs, including their lives, they stay there and they do. Now that takes discipline, that takes a lot of work. A West Point graduate named Samuel Ringgold used the time to relentlessly drill his light artillery units, a fast-moving force the soldiers called flying artillery. In battle, Taylor was known to favor his infantry, relying on the brutal efficiency of the bayonet. Major Ringgold was eager for the chance to prove the worth of his men, and Lieutenant Dana was tired of waiting. Dear Sue, if Mexico declares war, I believe General Taylor means to march us right on to Matamoros. If he does, it is to be hoped that we will not get a whipping. What a military show we have here, and how much of the pomp of war and none of the glory. I wish I had all of my glory and was on my way home again. But let us hold on and see what Mr. Polk is going to do. Dear Julia, Everyone rejoices at the idea of leaving Corpus Christi. It is to be hoped that our troops being so close on the borders of Mexico will bring about a speedy settlement of the boundary question. I think the chances of a fight are about equal to the chances for peace. Ulysses Grant. On the 8th of March, 1846, with the Dragoons and Major Ringgold's flying artillery leading the way, the U.S. Army crossed the Nueces River, heading south. With the failure of the Slidell mission, Polk had ordered Taylor to take a position on the Rio Grande, called the Rio Bravo by the Mexicans, opposite the town of Matamoros. The decision was certain to anger Mexico further. Mexico had claimed the Nueces River as its border with Texas, but Polk had adopted Texas' claim that the border was at the Rio Grande. When Taylor crossed the Nueces, he was crossing into disputed territory. He was in territory that Mexico claimed legitimately as part of its own land. And if he went down as far as the Rio Bravo and crossed it, then he would be in territory that wasn't even in dispute. It was Mexican territory. In late March, the first of Zachary Taylor's soldiers reached the north bank of the Rio Grande. Across the river in Matamoros, a crowd of Mexican soldiers and civilians watched as the U.S. troops rigged a flagpole and ran up the Stars and Stripes. The soldiers of the Army of the North were angered by the enemy's insult. 
for the first time, that flag waved proudly before our forces, as if taking possession of what rightfully belonged to us. Jose Maria Iglesias. The U.S. troops set to work building an earthen and wood fort they called Fort Texas. And for three weeks, tensions mounted as the U.S. and Mexican armies faced each other across the Rio Grande. We are prepared for attack at any moment, often sleep in our clothes. Both sides appear to be always on the alert. We heard the Mexican horns and bugles across the river, blowing all night. Lieutenant Napoleon Dana. As more Mexican troops gathered in Matamoros, some European observers predicted a quick Mexican victory. Mexico's regular army was three times as large as that of the United States. But the ranks were filled with inexperienced troops, peasants and Indians pressed into service through what were called cuotas de sangre, quotas of blood. The army did have its elite, among them handsomely uniformed lancers, whose skill on horseback was matched by their courage. But the army lacked a corps of well-trained officers, and Mexican military tactics had not changed since the days of the Spaniards. On April 24th, the stalemate on the Rio Grande was broken when fresh troops led by General Mariano Arista arrived in Matamoros. That same day, Arista sent 1,600 soldiers across the Rio Grande. At Rancho de Caracitos, about 20 miles from Fort Texas, the Mexican soldiers surprised a U.S. scouting party. Fuego! The attack killed 14 U.S. soldiers and wounded seven. The rest were taken prisoner. The skirmish at Rancho de Caracitos was over in minutes. But as far as Zachary Taylor was now concerned, the United States was at war. The general sent a dispatch to Army headquarters in Washington. April 26, 1846. Hostilities may now be considered as commenced, and I have this day deemed it necessary to prosecute the war with energy and carry it, as it should be, into the enemy's country. General Zachary Taylor. Taylor knew he was in a dangerous position. His supplies were on the coast at Point Isabel. The army's survival depended on protecting them. The general set out for Point Isabel with 2,000 soldiers, leaving 500 troops to defend Fort Texas, with orders to fight to the last man. The Mexican artillery in Matamoros rained a continual barrage on Fort Texas. The shelling could be heard all the way to Point Isabel. Lieutenant Ulysses Grant remembered the dreadful sound. As we lay upon the seashore, the artillery at the fort could be distinctly heard. The war had begun. What General Taylor's feelings were, I do not know, but for myself, a young second lieutenant who had never heard a hostile gun before. I felt sorry that I had enlisted. Taylor's men quickly loaded their supplies into 200 wagons and began the march back to Fort Texas. On the afternoon of May 8th, they found General Arista's army waiting for them. A line of nearly 4,000 Mexican soldiers, infantry, cavalry, and artillery stretched a mile across a wide plain of tall, sharp grass and cactus. The Battle of Palo Alto began with the roar of cannon fire and quickly turned into an artillery duel. The soldiers of Major Ringgold's flying artillery used their skills to deadly effect. Advancing their batteries at full gallop, they could unlimber, fire, remount, and whirl off to a new position with astonishing speed. Time after time, Ringgold's units raked the Mexican lines, slashing their ranks with a rain of hot iron. 
The American artillery ravaged the Mexican ranks horribly. The troops, frustrated by the needless deaths, cried out for permission to attack the enemy at Bayonet's Point and die as brave men should. Jose Maria Iglesias. But Arista's officers ordered the Mexican troops to hold their position. This they did, at the cost of many lives. As Ringgold advanced yet again on the Mexican lines, a cannonball ripped through both his thighs. The wound was horrible, and the Major lingered for three days before he died. When evening fell, the Mexican troops withdrew to reorganize, while the U.S. soldiers passed the night on the battlefield. The weary men slept through the groans and screams of the wounded from both sides. The surgeon saw, said one, was going the live long night. During the night, General Arista had ordered his army to fall back to a new position at Resaca de la Palma, an old riverbed cutting across the road to Fort Texas. Arista had chosen well. A natural barrier of thick and thorny underbrush lined the riverbed. But encouraged by the previous day's success, Taylor ordered his men forward. Now, U.S. and Mexican soldiers met each other face to face. feelings. I do not think that our war will last much longer. The people of Mexico will not stand it. On Saturday, May 9th, unaware of the fighting in Texas, President Polk and his cabinet discussed what steps to take next with Mexico. All agreed that if the Mexican forces at Matamoros committed any act of hostility on General Taylor's forces, I should immediately send a message to Congress recommending an immediate declaration of war. In fact, Polk had already started to draft a war message. The president was frustrated by the failure of the Slidell mission. He hoped a declaration of war would pressure Mexico into resolving the Texas border issue and selling its northern territories. At six o'clock that very evening, Polk received the news he needed to make his case to Congress. It was Taylor's report describing the Mexican attack on his scouting party at Rancho de Caracitos two weeks earlier. 
That night and all day Sunday, the president worked on completing his call to arms. After repeated menaces, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States and shed American blood upon the American soil. As war exists, notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it, and exists by act of Mexico herself, we are called upon by every consideration of duty and patriotism to vindicate the honor, the rights, and the interest of our country. Polk's war message was cheered by expansionists in Congress and attacked by a small but vocal opposition. Some charged that Polk had overstepped the authority of his office by starting a war without congressional approval. Others opposed the war because they opposed slavery. They feared that any land taken from Mexico would add more slave territory to the Union. The arguments which Polk's Democrats used were, we must back up the troops. They have been attacked by Mexico and we must send them supplies and we must send them reinforcements. And if we do that, we might as well declare war. In the end, Congress authorized $10 million and 50,000 volunteers. It was a small but historic appropriation. For the first time, tens of thousands of American soldiers would be sent to fight on foreign soil. Just as the U.S. Congress issued its call for volunteers, news of Taylor's victories at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma swept the nation. The war was the first in U.S. history to be covered by mass circulation newspapers. The Alamo, Goliad, and other stories from the Texas Revolution 10 years earlier had made a deep impression on people in the United States. Many were eager to join the fight. The news was, was hailed with a great deal of excitement. It was just a, a, a wave of, of uh, rejoicing and excitement, the news of these battles. Business was suspended, shops would close, people would be out in the streets celebrating. Uh, and of course, uh, it had a direct impact on the recruiting of the volunteers. And the volunteers now flooded the, the recruiting offices in numbers that, that uh, far exceeded the quotas. In New York, Walt Whitman, poet and editor of the Brooklyn Eagle, fanned the flames of American patriotism with editorials bursting with passion and prejudice. Let our arms now be carried with a spirit which shall teach the world that while we are not forward for a quarrel, America knows how to crush as well as how to expand. What has miserable, inefficient Mexico, with her superstition, her burlesque upon freedom, her actual tyranny of the few over the many, what has she to do with the peopling of the new world, with a noble race? Be it ours to achieve that mission. Dramatic images of the war spread to parlors and drawing rooms through inexpensive prints and sheet music. Pianos were extremely popular during this period of time, and there was a flood of sheet music being issued, published uh, with beautiful, embellished, and, and sometimes fantastic lithographs uh, describing at least the perception of some of the battles. Major Samuel Ringgold, the artillery officer killed at Palo Alto, became the first martyr of the war with Mexico. Oh, heard ye that shout, we have conquered. And music, there was music written for him, the lament for Major Ringgold, and lithographs, a, a great many, not always agreeing on how he died. There was this thirst for, for heroes and this idea that the Mexican War opened up a new heroic age. 
uh, now that would help to strengthen and enhance the model republic in the eyes of the world. And, and Ringgold had the, had the good fortune of being killed uh, in the first battle. Young men who had never experienced war imagined themselves carrying on the glorious tradition of the founding fathers of the Republic. Some wore uniforms of their own devising. They brought their own horses and elected their own officers. Like many civic-minded men, 45-year-old Jefferson Peake of Warsaw, Kentucky, raised his own company of volunteers. Peake went to war, leaving behind a wife and seven children to tend the family farm. Dear children, you must all try to behave, and you must feed and salt the cow twice a day. And tell Sarah Ann to put out the sun every day for Ma's cherries and raspberries and take them in at night. Wallace and Jeff, my dear boys, See how well you can conduct yourselves. I remain your dear father until death. Jefferson Peak. Jefferson Peak joined thousands of other volunteers who packed the riverboats that steamed down the Ohio and Mississippi, heading for Mexico and the halls of Montezuma. In Mexico City, the government reacted with anger and disbelief to President Polk's claim that Mexico had started the war. Los Mexicanos estaban defendiendo su casa. The Los Mexicans were defending their home. En el que the ones coming todo. into the territory, who were foreigners, eran were the Americans. Mexico nunca declaró Mexico never declared war against the United States. The Mexican government issued a declaration of the need to defend its national territory. Not one member of the Mexican army was ever in North American territory. Not even in the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca. This was territory in dispute. By the end of May 1846, Zachary Taylor's army had crossed the Rio Grande and occupied the city of Matamoros. There were those in the United States who were certain that the war would be over quickly. Mexico would prove them wrong. As Taylor waited for reinforcements, the Mexican government issued a call to arms. One defeat does not decide the war. Mexico must fight to the end. And as long as there is one man remaining, he must go and fight the unjust invaders. By the spring of 1846, a border dispute between the United States and Mexico had exploded into war. In bloody fighting on the Texas battlefields of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, U.S. troops had pushed Mexican forces south of the Rio Grande. By the end of June, a second U.S. Army was on the march west, and the war would sweep across the continent into the Mexican borderlands of New Mexico and California, there to be stopped only by the waters of the Pacific Ocean. The war for the borderlands would forever change the lives of its people. Many would be forced to accept a new identity under a foreign flag. Others would choose to fight to the death. Later that year, U.S. troops would attack Mexico's northern provincial capital of Monterrey. For the first time, Mexicans would be forced to defend themselves street by street and house by house. <laughs> 
On May 13, 1846, U.S. President James K. Polk signed a congressional declaration of war against Mexico. The president's objective was to secure the Texas border. Then he would try and force Mexico to sell its northern territories of New Mexico and California to the United States. Each was a valuable prize. The Santa Fe Trail through New Mexico was the most important commercial route in the West. And California's deep water harbors would give the United States access to more profitable trade routes across the Pacific. Immediately, Polk acted on a three-part strategy. First, he ordered the Navy to blockade Mexico's coastlines. Zachary Taylor's army, fresh off its victories on the Rio Grande, would push into northeastern Mexico. And a second army would march west to occupy New Mexico and California. If Mexico would not sell its borderlands, Polk would take them by force. At Fort Leavenworth in present-day Kansas, more than 1,600 U.S. soldiers, including 1,000 volunteers from Missouri, prepared to head west along the Santa Fe Trail. The Army of the West was led by Colonel Stephen W. Kearney, a tough, disciplined career officer with 30 years experience on the Western Plains. Kearney's orders were to march the 900 miles from Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe and occupy New Mexico. From Santa Fe, he was to continue another 1,000 miles to California. There, he would meet the naval warships sent by Polk and take California too. The assignment was to conquer half a continent, and Kearney was ready to begin. In late June of 1846, he ordered his men west. The prairies but the sea of grass O'er which our wagons roll We'll reach the Arkansas at last And good old Mexico The soldiers marched across rolling fields of grass that slowly gave way to vast stretches of barren terrain. General Kearney is a rough old man For this we only know He's marched us some 800 miles To fight old Mexico Indians, who had never seen so many white men on the trail, watched in amazement as the seemingly endless columns churned up a cloud of dust that hung suspended for miles across the horizon. The army included a survey party led by Lieutenant William Emery. Emery's mission was to survey possible railroad routes to lay the groundwork for the expansion of the United States westward. That the United States would expand he had no doubt. The road presents few obstacles for a railway, and if it continues as good to the Pacific, it will be one of the routes over which the United States will pass immense quantities of merchandise into what may become in time the rich and populous states of Sonora, Durango, and Southern California. For now, California was almost 2,000 miles away the trail would lead first to New Mexico. New Mexico was one of the most populous provinces on Mexico's northern frontier. Yet outside the safety of a few settlements like Santa Fe, Taos, and Albuquerque, New Mexico was Indian territory. Ever since the Spanish conquest, settlers had lived among Pueblo Indians, Navajos, Apaches, Comanches, and Utes, Relations between them had long been marked by outbreaks of violence and rebellion. On the eve of the war with Mexico, relations with Indians had actually worsened rather than improved. And one sees that in the laments of frontiersmen as they beg the central government for military help. The territory's governor, Manuel Armijo, sought help from Mexico City. But to wait for protection from the central government, wrote one New Mexican would be to wait in vain. We are surrounded on all sides by many tribes of heartless barbarians, almost perishing. And our brothers, instead of helping us, are at each other's throats in their festering civil wars. 
The people of the capital city of Mexico were very preoccupied with resolving political problems concerned with the formation of the state and of the government. And this caused them to concentrate more on the center of the country. And the frontier was not attended to with the care and the concern that it merited at the time. Forced to rely on themselves, many New Mexicans look to the Santa Fe Trail and new opportunities for trade with the United States. Mexico put itself in the position of the sheep inviting the lion to come dine, <laughs> and the lion came. That is to say, uh, the um, mercantile conquest of what would become the southwestern part of the United States uh, really was the real conquest. The trail brought New Mexicans items they could not get as easily from Mexico. Iron and steel tools, medicine, machine-made textiles. The wagon trains also brought North American traders, and many came to stay. One of the most successful of these was an entrepreneur named Charles Bent. Based in Taos, Bent was part owner of a trading post on the Santa Fe Trail, north of the U.S.-New Mexico border. The post was called Bent's Fort. It was managed by Charles' brother, William. Both men had married into prominent families. William was married to Owl Woman, the daughter of a Cheyenne holy man. Charles was married to Maria Ignacia Jaramillo, cousin to Governor Armijo. But some New Mexicans saw the growing influence of the Bents and others like them as a threat. As the number of traders increased, Armijo became alarmed. Armijo then, early on, warned the Mexican government against people like Bent. Later, when it became clear that there was going to be no help from Mexico to stem the flow of immigrants, then Armijo tended to befriend those very immigrants, go into business with them, and find, as a practical matter, the best way to get along with them was to join them. Armijo was a shrewd businessman. Even now, the governor had wagons of his own coming down the Santa Fe Trail. What he did not know was that this time, the trail would also bring an invading army. On July 29, 1846, Stephen Kearney's Army of the West reached Bent's Fort. 1,600 men and 20,000 animals crowded into the fort's plaza and sprawled across the surrounding plain. From inside an upstairs room, a young woman named Susan McGoffin lay ill on her bed. McGoffin and her husband had been on their way to Chihuahua with a wagon train full of merchandise. The war had overtaken them, and McGoffin marveled at the commotion outside. July. 18 and 46. The shoeing of horses, neighing and braying of mules, the crying of children, the scolding and fighting of men are all enough to turn my head. The fort is crowded to overflowing. Colonel Carney has arrived, and it seems as if the world is coming with him. For three days, Carney allowed his troops to rest. The soldiers had marched more than 600 miles through blistering heat and choking dust. Now they could drink juleps made with brown sugar and Taos whiskey. Their stay was short. Kearney was eager to move on. On August 2nd, the Army of the West left Bent's Fort and crossed the Arkansas River into New Mexico. In Santa Fe, Governor Armijo was told that the army was coming, but there was little he could do with the few regular troops at his command. Still, he urged all New Mexicans to resist. Let us be comrades in arms. 
Rest assured that your governor is willing and ready to sacrifice his life and all his interests in the defense of his country. During the next few days, between three and four thousand poorly armed New Mexicans gathered where the Santa Fe Trail wound through a narrow pass here at Apache Canyon. Told that the New Mexicans were waiting for them, the U.S. troops descended into the narrows, sure that the screams of the enemy would soon pierce the air. But at the bottom of the canyon, the U.S. soldiers were met by only eerie silence. Despite protests from his own men, Armijo had ordered the New Mexicans to disband. The governor had fled south to Chihuahua. Why? One of the great mysteries. But certainly part of his calculation must have been that his forces were not particularly well armed. Many of the New Mexicans fought against Indians with bows and arrows. Kearney's troops passed through Apache Canyon unopposed. That same afternoon, they entered Santa Fe. Black eyes looked through the latticed windows at our column of cavaliers, some gleaming with pleasure and others filled with tears. Strange indeed must have been the feelings of the citizens, all the future of their destiny vague and uncertain. Their new rulers, strangers to their manners, language, and habits. Richard Elliott, St. Louis Reveille. In the plaza at the heart of the city, U.S. soldiers raised the stars and stripes above the governor's palace, and Kearney read a proclamation he had issued in each town along the way. The acting governor of New Mexico then spoke in response. Do not find it strange if there has been no manifestation of joy and enthusiasm in seeing this city occupied by your military forces. To us, the power of the Mexican Republic is dead. No matter what her condition, she was our mother. With the occupation in place, Kearney worked to establish a provisional government one of his first duties was to meet with a delegation of Pueblo Indians. Centuries earlier, the Pueblos had greeted the arrival of the Spanish with curiosity and hospitality. And when the Americans came, I think uh, the whites, uh, as opposed to the, the Spanish-Mexicans, uh, I think that there was a different relationship because the relationship between the Mexican and the native people was already tinged by a lot of uh, atrocities and, and, and wars and, and, and greed, if you may. And by the time that I think the Americans came, uh, there was a lot of mistrust, and rightly so. Lieutenant William Emery knew that the Pueblos had more than once risen in revolt against the Spanish and Mexican authorities. 300 years of oppression and injustice have failed to extinguish in this race the recollection that they were once the peaceable and inoffensive masters of the country. They are our fast friends now and forever. The lieutenant did not know that before long, his fellow Americans would be seen as the oppressors and that bloodshed would follow. Near the end of September, 1846, Kearney marched for California with a company of dragoons and Lieutenant Emery's survey party. Before leaving, he appointed Charles Bent as the new territorial governor of New Mexico. The decision angered many New Mexicans. Many people who had been there for a long time, whose family was very, very uh, influential, believed that even though they might not have welcomed the Americans with open arms, that they would have a place in the new regime. They do not get that place, and they're very resentful of it. At the same time, there are many people who are, who are proud, who are proud of their Hispanic heritage, and they see Americans as relatively uncultured people who were coming in and who were occupying their land. Resistance to the new government spread. In Taos, on the cold night of January 19, 1847, Charles Bent was at home with his family. Suddenly, New Mexican and Pueblo Indian rebels kicked in the door. Certain that he was loved by the people of his adopted hometown, Bent tried to calm the intruders. His daughter, Teresina, was five years old at the time. Later, she recalled what happened that night. Father told them 
what wrong have I done to you? When you come to me for help, I always helped you and your families. Yes, you did, but you have to die now so that no American is going to govern us. Then they commenced to shoot with the arrows and guns. The men threw the mortally wounded bent to the floor and scalped him alive. The revolt spread quickly throughout the region. Rebels set fire to stores and homes. U.S. citizens and those thought to be sympathizers were tortured and killed. Padre Antonio Jose Martinez, a popular priest and educator, opened his home to terrified families seeking refuge from the violence. Martinez called for an end to the bloodshed, but the revolt would claim the lives of many more. On February 3rd, Colonel Sterling Price and his U.S. troops arrived at Taos Pueblo, where 700 rebels and their families had dug themselves in. There may have been a lot of fear at that time, but then there was also the feeling that this force could be repelled. The battle began with a blast of U.S. artillery. For hours, the battery pounded at the walls of the Pueblo. Many inside sought the safety of the heavily defended church. But on the second day, U.S. soldiers hacked through the church's wall and fired a cannon into the breach. Dragoons set the roof on fire. The screams of the wounded echoed into the mountains. Some escaped into the open fields where they were ridden down and killed. Those who were there said the creek running through the Pueblo turned red with blood. When it was over, Colonel Price reported 150 New Mexicans and Pueblo Indians dead. U.S. casualties were seven dead and 45 wounded. Price wasted little time in bringing the rebel leaders to trial. 15 defendants were sentenced to death, one for high treason. Padre Martinez called the proceedings frightful and pleaded with Colonel Price for justice. The prosecutor and defense attorneys speak only English. Without explaining to them in Castilian the misfortune that they are being notified of condemnation. And finally, I neglected to mention the quality of the sentencing jury a class of ignorant men tainted with passion. From rooftops, the people of Taos watched as the convicted men were hanged. Louis Girard, a young adventurer from the United States, helped cut down the bodies. With the execution of those for murder, he wrote, no fault should be found. But for a man to rise in defense of his native country and be hanged for treason, that, Gerard thought, was an atrocity most damnable. On the curve of the river, fringed with large cottonwoods, the moon shone brightly, and all was as still as death, except when a flock of geese or sand cranes were disturbed in their repose. Lieutenant Woody Memory. South by the Rio Grande, then west towards the Gila River, the 110 men under Stephen Kearney's command marched into the wilderness. The tiny band of soldiers was guided by Kit Carson, the already legendary Taos Trapper. Carson had warned them all, the journey would be hard. At the end, the men would be starving. Lieutenant Emery wondered if they would survive, even as he coolly measured the features of a strange new world. Strolling over the hills alone, I was struck with the fact that not one object in the whole view, animal, vegetable, or mineral, had anything in common with the products of any state in the Union, with the single exception of the cottonwood. 
Emery marveled at what he called the perfect stillness and quietude of the landscape. For the native peoples he was soon to meet, this was sacred ground. Most Indian people, and particularly some of the Indian people in the Southwest, have a very deep religious connection with their lands. Their gods are in the land themselves. For many Native American people, history, as we understand it, is as much a function of place as it is of time. The soldiers marched over cedar and pine-covered hills, making their way through the land of the Apache Indians. Emery wrote that the Apaches they met saw the U.S. soldiers as allies. For generations, the Apaches and the Spanish had waged war against each other. Now, the Mexican government was paying handsomely for Apache scalps. One of the chiefs broke out in a vehement manner. You have taken New Mexico and will soon take California. Go then and take Chihuahua, Durango, and Sonora. We will help you. The Mexicans are rascals. We hate and will kill them all. Native American people have often been able to retain our, our autonomy by holding, by, by balancing one colonial power against another. The problem, of course, with Kearney's occupation of the American Southwest is that the balance now is gone, and Indian people then find themselves uh, at the mercy of the Americans, which in many instances uh, proved to be disastrous. For the Native Americans of the Southwest, Kearney's passage would signal the beginning of the most bitter and tragic chapter in the history of their people. But here, beneath the distant sky, the men of Kearney's command could not have seemed so significant. Beyond the Colorado River, past ancient abandoned cities, past the cultivated fields of the Pima and Maricopa tribes, across the desert lands of the Mojave Indians. With every labored step, the soldiers pushed the U.S. frontier westward to California. California. This Mexican territory lay so far from Mexico City that its people were called those from the other shore. About 7,000 Californios lived here, mostly along the coast. For many, it was a good life. California's harbors had become busy ports of call for trading ships from many nations. Cowhides from the region were so popular they were known as California banknotes. Among the rancheros who profited most from the growing economy was Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. His vast land holdings included some 150,000 acres in the Sonoma Valley, north of San Francisco Bay. Over the years, Vallejo had built his reputation and his estate by faithfully serving Mexico as an officer in the army. But like other Californios, Vallejo had come to resent Mexico's neglect of the region. The Mexican government did not have on the frontier a single horse, rifle, cannon, or soldier. For a long time, there was not a soldier in the garrison who did not receive his food and clothing, but out of what I gave him, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. In the 1830s, the isolated Californios began to welcome settlers from other countries. About 60 miles from Vallejo's home, a trading post on the Sacramento River called Sutter's Fort attracted a large colony of immigrants from the United States. Each year brought more wagons streaming across the mountains. The tide was rising in part because of the exploits of a man known as the Pathfinder. Captain John Charles Fremont was arrogant and reckless, but he was also one of the most famous explorers of his time. Fremont's reputation was built on the work of his wife, Jessie, a talented writer who edited his journals and reports into books that inspired thousands to head west. <laughs> 
Our neighbors got hold of Fremont's story of California and Oregon, brought the book to my husband to read, and he was carried away with the idea, too. I said, oh, let us not go. Our neighbors, some of them old men and women, had large families, but it made no difference. We sold our home, and everything we could not take with us or sell, we gave away and joined the company for California. Mary Annie Jones. Mariano Viejo viewed the growing colony of Americans in California with mixed emotions. Vallejo knew too well what had happened in Texas once Americans had outnumbered Mexican settlers. Vallejo was fascinated with, with Americans because they represented for him a set of Republican ideals that he had been tracing uh, from his youth when he, from the time he read Rousseau. On the other hand, he also saw that Americans represented a threat uh, to the well-being of California. In December of 1845, Californios were both puzzled and concerned when Captain John Charles Fremont and 65 heavily armed men made their way out of the snow-laden mountains and into Sutter's Fort. The captain was supposed to be on a mapping mission for the U.S. government, but whatever his skills as an explorer, Fremont was no diplomat. In a dispute with local authorities, the hot-tempered captain planted a U.S. flag on a mountaintop for all to see. Californios were outraged, and Fremont avoided a fight only by heading north to Oregon. Still, the incident reinforced a hard truth for Californios. Their province was ripe for the taking. Mexico could not protect them. Some talked of independence, others of establishing an alliance with Britain or France. Mariano Vallejo argued that California's best hope lay in an alliance with the United States. To rely any longer upon Mexico to govern and defend us would be idle and absurd. Why should we shrink from incorporating ourselves with the happiest and freest nation in the world, destined soon to be the most wealthy? Vallejo's good opinion of Americans would soon be put to the test. Three months after planting his flag in the mountains, Captain John Fremont came riding back to Sutter's Fort. By now, the U.S. settlers in the area were anxious and angry, certain they would be forced to leave California. No one knows for sure whether Fremont was acting under orders or on his own, but the captain suggested a plan. If the settlers took a few influential Californios prisoner, Perhaps they could start a chain of events that would end with California under U.S. control. In the early dawn of June 14, 1846, Mariano Vallejo was awakened by a band of American settlers pounding on his door. One of them later described his companions. Almost the whole party was dressed in leather hunting shirts. Many of them were greasy. They were about as rough looking a set of men as one could well imagine. Anyone would feel some dread at falling into their hands. Dressed in his military uniform, Vallejo faced the group. To what happy circumstances, Vallejo is reported to have said, shall I attribute the visit of so many exalted personages? The men declared that they were establishing an independent republic in California. General Vallejo was placed under arrest and forced to sign an official surrender. The Americans then helped themselves to Vallejo's brandy and wine. Soon they were shouting at each other, locked in a drunken debate over the wording of their Declaration of Independence. Choose this day what you shall be, said one. Either we are robbers or we must be conquerors. Later that morning in the plaza, the rebels raised a homemade flag featuring a crudely fashioned grizzly bear. The robbers hoisted a piece of linen about the size of a large towel. In it was painted a red bear and a lone star. A band of ungrateful horse thieves, trappers, and runaway sailors. <laughs> <laughs> 
Rosalía Vallejo Liz. Mariano Vallejo and his brother Salvador were taken under armed escort to Sutter's Fort. Vallejo had hoped that Fremont would release them. Instead, the captain ordered them held prisoner. Salvador Vallejo remembered it as a day of humiliation and betrayal. My heart grieved for my brother when the light of day allowed me to see him lying on a damp floor without coverings or even a pillow on which to rest his head. I cursed the days in which our house dispensed hospitality to a race of men deaf to the call of gratitude. So perfect strangers to good breeding. Sailing in the waters off the California coast, U.S. Commodore John D. Sloat cautiously entered Monterey Harbor. In the event of a declaration of war, his orders were to occupy California's ports and, if possible, to bring about the peaceful annexation of the territory. But when told that Fremont and the Bear Flaggers had started a rebellion, Sloat knew he had to act. Doña Maria de las Angustias de la Guerra remembered the day clearly. During the morning, the preparations could be seen. Many armed boats filled with men came ashore and took possession without any interference. There was no garrison. And I believe the only Mexican officer present was old Captain Mariano Silva. The conquest of California was not a pleasant event for the Californians. But I must confess that California was on the road to the most complete room. When the Bear Flaggers heard the news from Monterey, they replaced their flag with the Stars and Stripes. The Independent Republic of California had lasted just three weeks. Five months later, in December of 1846, the exhausted soldiers of Stephen Kearney's command finally reached San Diego. The nearly 2,000-mile journey across the continent had landed them in the thick of war. Californios were fighting back against the U.S. occupation. Just 40 miles from the coast, near the village of San Pasqual, Kearney's troops had suffered heavy casualties in a clash with a company of skilled Californio lancers. But the battle at San Pascual did little to change the course of the struggle for California. In late December, U.S. forces advanced on Los Angeles. At San Gabriel and again at La Mesa, the Californios fought bravely, but to no avail. It was the last stand made by the sons of California for the liberty and independence of their country, whose defense will always do them honor. Guillermo Prieto. By the time Mariano Vallejo learned of the fall of Los Angeles, he was back in Sonoma, still recovering from his six-week captivity at Sutter's Fort. I left Sutter's Fort half dead and arrived here almost without life. But I'm now much better. Political change has cost a great deal to my person and mind, and likewise to my property. All is lost, and the only hope for making it up is to work again. Disillusioned with the United States and with Mexico, Vallejo was still forced to choose. In the plaza in front of his home, he carefully folded his Mexican military uniforms into a neat pile and burned them. The war in the borderlands was over. But even with California and New Mexico under U.S. control, President Polk faced a frustrating predicament. He had the territories he wanted for the U.S., but he could not keep them unless Mexico surrendered. And this, Mexico would not do. But the U.S. invasion of Mexico would take place on more than one front. From Santa Fe, Colonel Alexander Donovan would lead 900 Missouri volunteers into Chihuahua 
General John E. Wool would march south from San Antonio, and General Zachary Taylor would prepare his army for a major offensive here on the Rio Grande. Matamoros, dear Julia, the two flowers you sent me come safe, but when I opened your letter, the wind blew them away, and I could not find them. Before I seal this, I will pick a wild flower up the bank of the Rio Grande and send you. Do you ever see me anymore in your dreams? I am certain that you would not know me. I am as badly sunburnt as it is possible to be. Ulysses Grant. In June of 1846, volunteers for Zachary Taylor's army were arriving by the shipload at Brazos Santiago, the port near Matamoros. By the end of June 1846, 12,000 U.S. soldiers were camped along the Rio Grande. There were shortages of everything. Zachary Taylor now had fewer wagons than he had at Corpus Christi, yet his army had grown to three times the size. President Polk was running the war on a tight budget, and Taylor complained about the lack of support from Washington. The general's success on the battlefield had sparked talk of his running for president, and Taylor wondered aloud whether he was the victim of political intrigue. I might suppose there was an intention among the high functionaries to break me down. The large force now under my command will, from design or incompetency of others, have to return to their homes without accomplishing anything. The responsibility will be thrown on me. General Zachary Taylor. In spite of the shortages, Taylor pressed forward with the campaign. In July, he ordered his troops to the village of Camargo, upriver on the Rio Grande. From Camargo, Taylor planned to march on the city of Monterey to the southwest. Some of the troops traveled by river, packed into the sweltering holds of leaky steamers. Others suffered through a brutal journey over land. We marched with a burning sun overhead and burning sand beneath our feet. Not a drop of rain had fallen, and the dust hung over our heads with smothering denseness from which there was no escape. In Camargo, the soldiers found no relief. The town was surrounded by limestone rock that radiated a stifling heat. The drinking water had been contaminated by a springtime flood. Most of the volunteers knew nothing about camp sanitation. Many became sick. Soon, they started to die. Men who had left their homes to sacrifice themselves in glorious battle died instead from diarrhea and dysentery. Scarcely a day elapsed that the muffled drums did not announce the departure of one or more poor fellows to the chaparral. The dead march was ever in our ears. Another young officer named George McClellan was horrified. They die, he said, like dogs. Soldiers reported that the death march was heard so often that mockingbirds whistled it back to the troops as they passed by. One out of every eight soldiers, 1,500 in all, perished at Camargo. Almost as many as would die in battle during the entire war. On the 19th of August, 1846, the first of Zachary Taylor's troops left Camargo for Monterey. The march was unbearably hot, but Major Philip Barber consoled himself with thoughts of his wife, Maddie. A few months earlier, the two had been together in Galveston, Texas. Never in my life have I enjoyed so much happiness. My dear Maddie was perfectly overcome with joy and seemed to cling to me during the whole stay with her as though a separation would be death. God grant that this war may soon terminate and we may again be permanently united. September 4th, 
No letters today from my husband. I expect he is on the march for Monterey. The next arrival will, I hope, bring me word of his safe arrival there. Zachary Taylor had been forced to march from Camargo with only 6,600 troops. Almost half the army had been left behind. Many of the volunteers were still sick and pack animals were scarce. To his great embarrassment, Lieutenant Ulysses Grant had been assigned to manage the mule trains. I'm not aware of ever having used a profane expletive in my life, but I would have the charity to excuse those who may have done so if they were in charge of a train of Mexican pack mules at the time. At Monterey, the city prepared to defend itself. The provincial capital of 10,000 had been reinforced with more than 7,000 soldiers led by General Pedro de Ampudia. Ampudia and many of his troops had fought at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. Here, they were determined to stop the invaders. On September 15th, with the U.S. Army less than a week's march from the gates of the city, Monterrey celebrated the eve of Mexico's Independence Day. As night fell, we faced an enemy proud of its victories in the midst of our own fears. A night when our most tender memories of home and independence were revived. The military bands announced the solemn hour in which our birth as a nation was proclaimed. All bowed to the sentiment of patriotism. They forgot all else and longed for the fight, for revenge, and for glory. Guillermo Prieto. On the 19th of September, camped in a shady grove the soldiers called Walnut Springs, Taylor and his generals went over their strategy. The U.S. Army was deep in enemy territory, facing a city of well-protected defenders. Taylor decided on a risky plan. He would split his army into two. While Taylor directed a diversionary attack on the city's east side, General William Worth would attack the west. There, Worth would capture the high ground on two hills called Federation and Independence. The road to Saltillo would be cut off, and with it, any hope of Mexican reinforcements. That night, Major Philip Barber and his fellow soldiers prepared for battle. The city has to be carried, and the bayonet will probably have to do the work. We must anticipate immense slaughter, but I feel calm and collected, having long since made up my mind that my life is the rightful property of my country and cannot be taken from me or preserved except by the fiat of the great God who gave it, Major Philip Barber. On the morning of the 21st, U.S. troops launched the diversionary attack on the city's east side. Almost immediately, Taylor's plan fell apart. Inexperienced commanders charged too close to the defending positions, leading their men into a murderous crossfire. Mexican guns swept the field from three directions. Our soldiers charged over the barricades, over the bodies of our enemies, over the haze of tainted blood, rose to the heavens the triumphant shouts of Viva Mexico! Three hundred ninety-four U.S. soldiers were killed or wounded. Among the dead was Major Philip Barber. Some wrote that he was killed instantly, shot through the heart. Others said that in his last moments, he thought of Maddie. When struck by the ball that caused his death, he immediately drew from his bosom his wife's miniature, opened it, and exclaimed, tell her I died on the field of victory put it to his lips, and instantly expired. Captain Kirby Smith. While the unexpectedly bloody fighting raged on the city's east side, 
General Worth's troops attacked both Federation and Independence Hills on the west. The battles were hard fought. Later, a Texas Ranger would say, I have never called a Mexican a coward since. Mexican defenders on top of Independence Hill raked the U.S. troops with cannon and musket fire from a large fortified building called the Bishop's Palace. Our men took after the infantry. The Texans were invaluable and brave as lions. They pursued so hotly that they entered pell-mell with the enemy into the palace before they could close their doors. The Mexican tricolor flag was hauled down and soon the star-spangled banner waved. Lieutenant Napoleon Dana. With the road to Saltillo cut off, U.S. troops now penetrated Monterrey from both the east and the west, fighting their way street by street towards the center. The houses were made of stone. Each had become a small fortress. Mexican defenders fired from rooftops and windows. Bullets rattled like hail on the street. One soldier said it was as if bushels of hickory nuts were being hurled on them. Amid the chaos, soldiers remembered isolated acts of mercy as though they had occurred in a dream. I saw a Mexican female carrying water and food to the wounded men of both armies. I saw her lift the head of one poor fellow, give him water and then take her handkerchief from her own head and bind up his wounds. I heard the crack of one or two guns, and she, poor good creature, fell. She was dead. I turned my eyes to heaven and thought, Oh God, and this is war. By mid-afternoon, the U.S. soldiers had nearly reached the central plaza. Shells were landing dangerously close to the cathedral, where explosive ammunition had been stored. That night, General Ampudia requested a truce. Taylor demanded complete surrender, but promised generous terms. Ampudia made the most of the opportunity, persuading Taylor to agree to an eight-week armistice. The Mexican soldiers were allowed to keep all their arms except the heavy cannon. On September 25th, the Mexican army withdrew from Monterrey. The departure of the Mexican army must have been dramatic, terrible. Perhaps it reminds me a bit of the departure from Tenochtitlan at the end of the siege of Hernán Cortés. That ailing and tattered caravan dragging along in misery, carrying its sick, its wounded, and suffering the want of everything that would allow it to fulfill a denigrating, terrible agreement. Honorable, perhaps, but terrible. When President Polk received news of the armistice, he was furious. If General Taylor had captured the Mexican army and deprived them of their arms, it would have probably ended the war with Mexico. But the president was forced to swallow his disappointment. The rest of the nation celebrated the Battle of Monterey as a glorious victory. Printmakers, songwriters, and playwrights commemorated the battle in a grand and romantic style. Especially popular was the Maid of Monterey. The moon was shining brightly upon the battle plain. A gentle breeze fanned lightly the features of the slain. The guns had hushed their thunder, the trumpet silence lay. Senorita, the maid of Monterey. But for the families of the Mexican and U.S. dead, there was no romance to be found in war. The poor private died unnoticed and unknown. Yet by some quiet hearthstone far from the tumult of cities, 
Tears will be shed for his fall. The stern old father will nerve himself to his loss by the thought that the sacrifice was made for his country, while the aged mother's heart bleeds with a wound time cannot heal. Thomas Bangs Thorpe. In December of 1846, a grieving widow in Galveston, Texas, read a letter from Monterey. Mrs. Philip N. Barber, my dear friend, may God grant you support and consolation under the weighty affliction that has befallen you. The loss you have sustained is alike irreparable to the regiment and the country. By the fall of 1846, there were some in Mexico who had started to wonder if God had turned his back on their country. It seemed the United States invasion could not be stopped. Still, Mexico would neither surrender nor negotiate. In the United States, President James K. Polk needed desperately to bring the war to an end. A new strategy was required, something bold and decisive. An assault on the very heart of Mexico, Mexico City itself. The operation would be carried out by a man many considered the most brilliant soldier in the United States Army, General Winfield Scott. But between Scott and Mexico City would stand the one person able to unite Mexico and turn back the invader. The exiled general and former president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. This series has been made possible by grants from the following. The National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the annual financial support from viewers like you. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And the Meadows Foundation. Additional support has been provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Summerlee Foundation, and the following organizations and individuals.